Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, an absolutely jam-packed episode. I'm going to finally be reviewing the little Juju Le Coultre, this little darling from the 1940s. Such a classy piece, lent in by my good friend Christian at Theo and Harris. Also, I've been given this gorgeous, gorgeous book, The Story of Rolex, so I thought I'd just have a quick glance at it with you guys. Ah, oh, just, uh, what a book, fantastic. Anyway, uh, also the first Eterna uh, on the channel. I came this close to buying one of their watches not so long ago, so I'm very, very excited about that. So um, I'm not gonna talk too much, let's roll the intro and get on with today's show. <laughs> Okay, welcome back guys. Now, before I get into uh, all of this lovely stuff, I should do a wristwatch check. And of course, uh, I posted this on my Instagram earlier today. People were going wild. I, it's funny, I wasn't even sure of it at first, but I put the Colorab, the blue Colorab. I'm not sure if this is the Siena or the Venezia. I can't remember. Anyway, it's it's in a video. So I put it on the little GMT. I haven't worn this for a while and I think it really, really works. I, it's funny, I was unsure at first, but it goes so well. The blue, the blue of the Pepsi with the, with the uh, distressed look. It's a bit early yet. It was almost 90 degrees today. I shouldn't really be wearing a leather in this kind of heat, uh, we've still got, you know, almost three, uh, three weeks of summer. I mean, uh, it's gonna be 90 degrees, so not really the appropriate weather for the straps yet, but, you know, autumn is my favorite time of year, so I'm kind of, uh, I'm, try I'm trying, to, trying to egg it on. Anyway, I'm already starting to ramble far too much. Um, let, what should we do first? Let's actually, let's have a look at the book first, because it is, Absolutely gorgeous. Obviously, I own Longitude by uh, Dava Sobel, one of the most important stories in horology. If you don't own that book and are into watches, you really should. Uh, I think I did a video of it not so long ago. But anyway, I think I might start collecting. I'm going to look into books on Tudor and Seiko uh, because those are two brands that I absolutely adore. Uh, what else? Um, possibly Cartier. I know Christian. My good friend Christian, he recently uh, looked at a beautiful Cartier book on his channel. Um, so that kind of, kind of, you know, that's egged me on. So poetic timing, really, that my good friend, he wants to stay anonymous, but it's a friend from the neighborhood. He just gave me this the other day and I was, I'm chuffed a bit. Uh, I know you're watching now, so thank you so much, my friend. Anyway, without further ado, I'm chatting, I'm rambling far too much. Let's change perspectives and have a closer look at this absolutely gorgeous book. The Rolex Story by Franz Christoph Hill. And the first thing you'll, you'll notice is that beautiful cover. You can see by the rehort here, it is a recent date just with uh, beautiful applied luminescent um, numerals. Anyway, so as I said, I, as I probably said in the intro, this is a beautiful gift from a friend. And I've got to say, I try and read as many classics as I can. Um, you know, Nietzsche, Kipling, uh, Conrad, um, Socrates, all, you know, that kind of stuff, because I do, I do, I do find reading quite difficult, um, and it takes me ages, so I have to really, if I'm going to read something, I'll make sure it's, it's really, uh, crucial, it's something, I'm, I don't want to waste my time, because also, I don't have that much time to read. Having said that, I don't own any books about, uh, with the exception of Longitude, obviously one of the most important uh, books on horology ever written. So this is a really nice addition or a start into building a collection. What an excellent idea. Let's dive in. And by the way, obviously I'm wearing my GMT. 
to mark this uh, occasion. So there we go, the Rolex crown there. Um, it's interesting, I've never really thought about the logo, but it, the crown, right? It's uh, quite aptly chosen. So the Rolex story, and there we go. First thing we see is a classic uh, 90s Submariner. Beautiful, absolutely stunning. So obviously this is quite a recent book because it does include all the ceramic models. Um, the first section is about the um, the brand itself, and there's the main man, Hans Wildsdorf, founder. Um, looks a little bit like my grandfather. How funny! It's the story of the company, and then basically we start the history of their watches. The hermetically sealed case. Uh, this is the, one of the first oysters. Oh, and I've got to say, it's really nice to have pictures, you know, not looking online. It's one of the earliest, look at that oyster case. It's so funny how you can see the DNA so evidently of, of its um, successors. Um, that actually looks quite panoramic, doesn't it? It talks about the first automatic movements that they had, uh, superfluative chronometer uh, certification, all the rest of it. Then we progress into the um, more recent age. It's factory, the famed parachrome spring. I'm just going to skip forward a bit. Then we have the next section is on the history of the models. So <laughs> look at that oysters with the with the oyster case, half fitting, um, beautiful two tone. Oh, is that with the pearl dial? Of course, oysters. Of course. <sighs> Oh, look at that submarine. Beautiful, nice, big pictures. It's so nice to have a huge picture, isn't it? God, it looks so yummy. I want to eat it. There we go. Sir Edmund Hillary there, of course. Beautiful chronograph movement. You can just see the column wheel there. It's not It's not over-decorated. It's, it's, it's still nice to look at, even though it's not, you know, the most of decorated movements. A solid gold Daytona. It's funny, I, I the only Daytona I've ever liked was the very, you know, the Paul Newman, the Paul Newman, here we go, there, that, you see, I like that, but of course I can never, <laughs> I'm never going to be able to afford one, the gold ones are not bad at all, oh, look at that, reference 6542, gorgeous, oh, I've got its descendant here, fantastic, instruments for your wrist, there we go, so diving, obviously, we enter into the Submariner Territory, that's quite a nice picture of um, together with its rivals, I should say. The two-tone. Um, it's quite interesting because I, I, I'm on my, this is my seventh, this GMT is my seventh Rolex I've owned now. Of all the Rolexes, the one I, particular model I've owned the most has to be the, um, the, the Datejust. This is this is actually my second GMT. I have on the um, ceramic GMT. Sea Dweller, I never got into because it's just too big for me. Ah, there's there's my former GMT. Yeah, it's it's a great watch. I just you know I think when it comes to the GMT, I like pre-ceramic, and when it comes to the Submariners, I like the the um, ceramic. You know, so I, it's kind of trial and error, but it's a great watch. It is a great watch. It is a great watch. It's association with sports. Some very unusual square Rolexes from the 1940s. Very interesting. Look at that case. Look at those pushes. Inc quite incredible. With um, is that a tele telemeter scale? I think. Or well, we've got various scales. I think one of them is, and then I think that's tetrametric. I'm, I might be wrong about that, but wow, that is a very blingy. Daytona. Yeah, as you can see, I'm looking at, the, I'm drooling over the. Actually, that's quite nice. I do like that. I don't mind that. I I got to admit. I got to admit. Anyway, the uh, yacht master never never really got in. I like the um, the first yacht master. The new ones, the yacht master two. This complication, I, I for a start, I don't even understand it, and I'm never well. I'm never say never, but. It's unlikely that I'm going to use it on a yacht, so that is very nice with the, that raised bezel. That is gorgeous. That is gorgeous. The blue dial version of that is absolutely gorgeous. And there we go. Dignified elegance. The date just. The beautiful close up. That's what's actually on the cover. This is the Rolex that I've owned the most of. I've owned three date justs. The versatility of this piece is unmistakable, and both me and Federico agree it's the most 
one of the most uh, versatile watches of all time. It's, you know, you can take it in the pool, you can wear it for dinner, but it's robust enough for any, pretty much most activities in life. Oh, the day date. Oh, the day date, just when you think it's over. Good. I do like the day date. And there we are. In the back, we have all the Rolexes. Everything from this, which is really going to be useful for me. So, my God, look at those chronographs. Look at those chronographs. So, yeah, this is very, very useful. Great reference. It's, it's obviously, it's simplified down. It's not going to have every single one, but we do have it going all the way up. Um, I don't think we have the new Air King, but I think the most recent one is this Submariner, the blue, the blue subby in white gold. So, uh, quite a good resource in the back. Gorgeous. Apps. I could drool over this all day. What a beautiful gift. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to treasure this. And I think this is going to kick off um, me collecting some books. Anyway, let's take it back to the studio. Okay, welcome back guys. So what do you think of the book? Please add your recommendations for great books down in the comments because it's another thing I want to collect. You guys know I love watches and I love books, but I didn't put two and two together. I don't know what's wrong with me, but anyway. Uh, so please put your recommendations down in the comments. Without further ado, let's take a closer look at this beautiful 1940s JLC Zhuzhi Le Coultre. So let's change perspectives now again and have a look at this watch close up. Today we are reviewing, finally reviewing, a beautiful, stunning little officer's watch made by Zhuzhi Le Coultre. Now, of course, this has been lent to me by my good friend Christian from uh, Theon Harris. If you're not familiar with Theon Harris, please subscribe to their channel and, of course, their brilliant website that has outstanding articles all about watches. Well, of course, what else do you expect? So. This is the first Zhuzhi Le Coultre that I've featured on the channel. It's not the Le Coultre you would expect. Uh, when you think JLC, you think of uh, you think of the Reverso. That's the first thing, that beautiful Art Deco Reverso. You think Memovox, uh, you think uh, Geophysique, uh, maybe even their high-end grand complications. They really are one of the most distinguished watch brands out there with an impeccable history and prestige to them. So, first of all, if you're not familiar with JLC, I'll just, if I go right close up, you can see, there you go, JLC. Now, JLC, they were founded all the way back in 1833, based in uh, Le Santier in Switzerland. But having said that, the, uh, the family, actually, the Le Coultre family, go all the way back to the 16th century. The name Zhuzhi, or Zhego, or however you want to pronounce it, I'm sure I'm completely destroying it, but nonetheless, was from Edmund Diego. He was a Paris-based watchmaker. Uh, and to the French Navy of all things and in about 1903 he teamed up with uh, Le Coultre and together they became the brand that we know today. Now, now currently they are owned by the Richemont group I think they got bought out I'm not quite sure when that happened but uh, they famously made in all the way back Antoine Le Coultre in 1844 he made the first Mille Metre, which was the first instrument capable of measuring a micron. A micron, which is quite incredible considering this is before the turn of the century. Also worthy of note is the keyless watch invented by Antoine. I believe that was in 1847. And of course the Le Coultre Calibre 145, which was in 1907, uh, which is the world's thinnest movement at 1.38 millimeters thick which is incredible considering this is from 1907 uh, also they're famed for their grand complications um, all the way up into the present day with the um, gyro tourbillon they keep innovating they keep developing these incredible feats of watchmaking obviously I i've mentioned before their most iconic watch is the reverso uh, which means reverse, reverso, as, as the name suggests. It's a um, watch that was released in um, 1931, I believe. It was designed uh, for polo players. The uh, actual main head of the watch would rotate to protect the glass. And it's considered a, a classic of art and deco design. And it's still made to this day. It's probably 
the most iconic uh, JLC of the day. There's also the uh, Dior plan, which was a little bit earlier, from 1925. Absolutely stunning. And then, of course, um, they also ventured into uh, clock making with the famous Atmos clock, which is an incredible invention. I almost bought one, actually. It uh, derives its energy from small temperature and atmospheric pressure changes so it um, is able to run without any human intervention for, for years which is just incredible also a beautiful thing to look at and they're usually displayed in these kind of see-through cases so just absolutely stunning another icon is probably the memo box that came out in 1950 and this particular one uh, was famously worn in Mad Men as well so they do have that kind of mainstream cachet as well I think actually a reverse always in the Batman franchise the recent Batman franchise I'm not sure about it but I'm pretty sure um, Christian Bale wore a, wore a um, reversal um, and that, that goes to show you know the um, I forget the character's name um, Bruce Wayne yeah it's the type of you know well well to do well moneyed um, upper classes would, would wear and, and that goes all the way back to the polar playing days in India, you know, of, of the colonial era. It has that kind of image to it. So basically, uh, that's a very brief history of, of Georges Le Coultre. I mean, obviously, I've, I've missed a hell of a lot out. But bringing it back to this beautiful, stunning little uh, watch here, as you can see, it is a military watch. Now, JLC also have a very long history of making some of the most highly regarded military watches. In fact, their Mark 11 is regarded as one of the finest military watches of all time. And I'll, I'll make sure I, I put a picture of it. Uh, and it was designed specifically to MOD, which is Ministry of Defence, for legibility, reliability and accuracy, of course. That came out during wartime. So this is from the 1940s, from what Christian has told me. Inside we have the calibre 469A, which is a, a completely in-house movement that JLC made. It has a very stubborn snapback case, which is a surprise considering, you know, the, the utilitarian nature of a watch like this. So there's no, there's no superfluous, ostentatious design. It's very, very kind of minimal, uh, even for the period. There are some, some little hints of typical style cues. The little minute track running on the inside of the dial is reminiscent of that famous uh, minute track you'll see on the square reversals but obviously this time round. We have a sub dial at the six o'clock beautiful very clear numerals running around the outside it's absolutely gorgeous and the, and the patina on those hands so basically the luminescent paint it's finely painted on the numerals as well but more so obviously on the hands. And I'm not sure if you can see that, but the hands are actually blued. You can see it where the light hits it. They are actually blued, which is a beautiful touch. Even though it is a military watch, there is a little bit of finesse. There is a little bit of, you know, the, the quality is there. Uh, very, very subtle and I just love it. It's got, got an understated class about it that is just unmistakable. So the fluorescent paint that has now patinaed beautifully is a mix of zinc sulfide and radium and that has burned away with the activity of the radium for years and obviously it does not glow in the dark anymore but what's left is this stunning stunning patina look that is just so gorgeous now Christian also told me that all the parts are original, including the inside. I'm not going to open it up because he said it was very stubborn to open up. I'm scared to, to wear this, obviously. I, I've borrowed it for a few weeks to, to, get a, to get a feel for it, but I really don't want to um, risk damaging it. Uh, we've also got this beautiful domed mineral crystal there that is in surprisingly good condition. That dial has almost a linen effect. At first I thought, had it aged, maybe it was it was a cream colour to begin with, but it I think it was originally that colour, I'm not sure. It's got a, almost a gold tint to it, it's very, very subtle, it's beautiful. It's got a lovely big crown with a matted finish on the side and then polished on the top. And when you wind it, just listen to this. Ah, oh, just gorgeous. Manual wind, obviously just has such a 
beautiful feeling to it. It, it does feel like a pocket watch. It, it really does remind me of winding a pocket watch. Anyway, let's quickly get the dimensions out of the way. And I must point out, if Christian is watching, don't worry, I have sellotape on the end of the calipers. 34 millimeter in diameter, the thickness of only just under 10 millimeters. Lug to lug, we're looking at 42, and then lug width, 16. So very, very small. Now, of course, this was typical of watch sizes in the day. I mean, it, even if we compare to a kind of mid-century size of the uh, GMT, the Rolex, which is a 40 mil, it does look tiny by comparison and even by today's standard. However, for this smaller wrist, I think 34 millimeter is absolutely fine. Now, this would actually ironically be a really nice dress watch now, which I know is it's not its initial in purpose. Oh, and now you can see that beautiful blued hand of the subdial as the light hits it. it. has actually got Swiss written on the bottom. It's signed there at the top in such a subtle way. It doesn't scream at you. It doesn't you know, it doesn't need to be like, hey, look at me. It's got, it's got a class. It's got an elegance it, that only a real vintage watch has. And he's put it on this beautiful um, leather strap that I think has, has kind of aged and distressed beautifully. And I think it just matches it. I, I can't really imagine this on any other strap. And I think the brown really plays nicely with the, the patinaed uh, look of the um, hands and dial. Anyway, let's quickly do a wrist shot. Okay, and there you go. On my tiny little wrist, it does fit incredibly well. And you've got to remember that uh, the watch sizes of this era, even up to the war, were a hell of a lot smaller. Uh, these days, we kind of equate larger watches. It's a bit more macho. But I actually think that watches of this size, if you can, have got a smaller wrist, obviously if you have big wrist it's gonna look dwarfed, but for a smaller wrist like mine I think it's absolutely perfect. So just a quick note, obviously there's no decoration on the movement, it's not, uh, there's no need to be. At the end of the day this is still a tool watch, even though now I would consider this a dress watch, that's just the way things go. I do love that subdial, and the layout does remind me of pocket watches especially. The astonishing thing is, is that you can pick these up for really not that much. I've seen similar versions, obviously not as nice as this one, but I've seen them go for about a thousand dollars. I'm not sure how, if Christian is selling this particular one, I would urge him not to because it's such a pristine example of a beautiful uh, 1940s watch. Something like this is, is, is what you'd keep forever and ever. Uh, and especially for a collector, this would be a prized possession. Having said that, I think um, if you were to find something like this, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it went for between one and two thousand dollars. It's definitely got something special. Collectors are obviously looking for the more sought after Mark 11, especially examples that have been specifically made for armies or, or departments of government, etc. Christian um, didn't say if this was made particularly for any army or, or government, but um, so it's a little bit of a mystery, which I kind of find it endearing. It has its own character, it's special, and I have yet to see anything similar. I'm not going to say anything negative about this watch because it's just got such class and character. Uh, it's got an elegance to it and, and so functional. It really is absolute pure class. It did even get me on eBay looking at vintage JLCs. Um, unfortunately, I didn't find anything quite as nice as this, uh, which is really unfortunate, but they are out there. You just got to look and eventually you'll find something like this, hopefully. But yeah, this is a really one of a kind, one of the classiest field watches I've ever seen and, and a beautiful way to introduce JLC to the channel. I mean, yeah, I could have easily borrowed a reverso or something, but I think this is something even more special. So a massive thank you to Christian for lending me this and I've really enjoyed it. I have kind of babied it. I've, it's unfortunate that I can't really wear it as it was intended um, because I'm just so scared of mucking it up. But I, I wore it at home and I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm gonna be sad to see it go. I'm definitely, it would suit my collection down to the ground. But 
I think eventually one day I'll get a JLC for myself. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, let's take it back to the studio. So what's next? Well, I think I'm going to end this episode with an unboxing. Uh, my good friend John, who is a Patreon member, supporter of the show, he gave me the beautiful uh, little, where is it? It's not here. I've actually erected a new bookshelf. I'm going to do a new desk tour eventually, but it's just off camera over there to house my ever expanding collection of die-cast models and tanks and warplanes and all the rest of it. It's sitting over there and it brings me happiness and a smile every day I look at it, but it's a beautiful uh, Italian uh, World War II fighter. He gave me that as a, a lovely gift. Uh, he has an incredible collection, uh, but he sent in his Eterna watch, which is a brand I've had my eye on for absolutely donkeys. I came this close to buying one uh, a week ago. So without further ado, let's change perspectives and have a look at this initial impressions and unboxing. So I'm going to be using the spider card. This is the Sage one, which is a fantastic knife. And I'll cover the history and all the rest of it in the full review. This is just an unboxing and the first impressions. So, um, oh wow. Wow, that's really nice. Beautiful wooden box. Very elegant indeed. Okay, drum roll please. Oh wow, now this is very elegant. Look how thin it is. Oh, I love how they've incorporated the those five circles of the Eterna brand into the crown, very slick. Little push button clasp, that's all oh, very nice. No display back, it's the reference 8310.41. Let's wind her up. Off she goes. I'm presuming it must be an ETA. Beautiful sword hands. Very elegant. Those lovely applied um, batons there. Date. It's, it's incredibly symmetrical. I mean, had it had no crown, it'd be perfectly symmetrical. Very nice leather. So this is the first thing on the show. The dial, it, it's kind of matted. If you can see the light there, this is sloped. The... Um, edge of the the dial where the where the glass where it meets the the glass wow it's very very my god it's flat it's there's almost no curve to it you must just sit on the wrist it is a big piece though but it gosh it is very elegant it does love the way those batons play with the light they've kind of got an angled do you see that they're slightly at an angle a bit matching the uh, hands this is very, very elegant indeed. The quality, I mean, it feels incredibly solid. It's very, very nice. And actually the logo makes it quite easy to grip. So it's practical too. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to review this very, very soon. Incredibly elegant. Uh, it's a brand, actually, I really like their divers. It is a brand I've had my own. I almost bought one just the other day, but um, being so broke, I, uh, I couldn't do it. Wow, look at the way the second hand has a curve to it. First impressions are very, very impressed, especially with the quality. Uh, it looks expensive and it feels expensive, but probably isn't expensive because it's not one of these brands that's all in your face. It's, it's a very um, under the radar. Uh, but in incredible history all the same. But anyway, can't wait to do the full review. Thank you very much, John. And let's take it back to the studio. I'm going to leave things there. Don't forget to add your comments, queries, questions, opinions, all the rest of it down in the comments below. I really do love hearing all your feedback. I do spend two hours every single day religiously replying to as many comments and emails as time allows. So bear with me, but I try and get back to as many of you as possible. Uh, but do add your comments, especially book recommendations as well. Don't forget to do that, please. Anyway, thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I'll catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.